If I get everybody's attention, uh, it's uh, great to have everybody here tonight at St. Timothy. I want to welcome everybody, especially up in the balcony, which is my favorite place to sit in all the church. So whenever I go and visit other churches, I always sit in the balcony. I love the balcony. Uh, we are privileged tonight to have uh, Marquis Laughlin uh, with us to present God's word to us from the book of Genesis. Uh, before we begin, we're going to have a word of prayer, but before we pray, just a couple of announcements to make. One is, is that following Marquis's presentation, we're going to take up an offering, a love offering uh, for Marquis. So I wanted to give you a heads up on that. And that in the back of the church, uh, there are videos and uh, CDs and DVDs and other uh, opportunities uh, that you can share in his ministry and uh, so those opportunities are available as well. Well, this is a, a great night. This is our third time to have Marquis with us. So let's bow our heads together in prayer. Lord, we invoke your blessings upon us as we come together tonight to hear God's word in a dramatic way. And we know that your word is powerful, living and active, sharper than a two-edged sword, uh, piercing us, laying bare who we are. And so I pray, God, tonight that as we hear your word spoken to us, that we might see ourselves as we really are and see you as you really are, a God who loves us and cares for us and sustains us every moment we're here on earth. Bless us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now as you join me in welcoming Marquis Laughlin. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above it. God called the expanse sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day, and God said, let the land produce vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years. And let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the expanse of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters teem with living creatures and let birds fly across the earth through the sky. And so God created every winged bird and all of the animals in the sea, everything with which the water teems. And God saw that it was good. 
And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures, livestock, wild animals, and creatures that move along the ground, each according to its kind. So God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them have dominion over all the earth. So God created man in his own image, in his own likeness. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the livestock, and all the creatures that move along the ground. And God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, they will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the livestock, and all the creatures that move along the ground, I give every green plant for food. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. <laughs> and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Now on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. You see, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, and no shrub of the field had yet appeared upon the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprung up, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground. And he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east in Eden, and there he put the man he had made. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden stood the tree of life, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you're free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Then the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and all the livestock, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man gave, named each living creature, well, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and all the livestock. But for Adam, well, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God formed a woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man. And he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Now for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. 
Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say that you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say that we must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, that we must not touch it or that we will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Now when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was pleasing to the eye and good for food and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day and they, they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? The man answered, I heard you in the garden and I, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Then the Lord said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man answered, the woman. You put here with me. She gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman answered, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. I would put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree that I commanded you, not to eat from. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing both good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out and take also and eat from the tree of life and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, the Lord placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son and named him Cain, saying, With the help of the Lord, I've brought forth a man. Now later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain, he worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. For the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, the Lord did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry. 
and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Then Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out into the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said, where's your brother Abel? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? But the Lord said, listen, what have you done? Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Whenever you work the ground, it would no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Then Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said, not so. If anyone kills Cain, he will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Now Adam lay with his wife again, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son and named him Seth, saying, God has granted me another child in place of Abel since Cain killed him. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years. Altogether, Adam lived 930 years, and then he died. Seth became the father of Enosh and had other sons and daughters. Seth lived 912 years, and then he died. Enosh became the father of Canaan, had other sons and daughters. Enosh lived 905 years, and then he died. Canaan became the father of Mahalel, had other sons and daughters. Canaan lived 910 years, and then he died. Mahalel became the father of Jared, had other sons and daughters. Mahalel lived 895 years, and then, well, he died. Jared became the father of Enoch, and had other sons and daughters. Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. Enoch became the father of Methuselah, and had other sons and daughters. Enoch lived 365 years. Enoch walked with God. And then he was no more because God took him away. Now Methuselah became the father of Lamech and had other sons and daughters. Methuselah lived 969 years. <laughs> and then he died. Now Lamech had a son. He named him Noah. After Noah was born, Lamech had other sons and daughters altogether. Lamech lived 777 years, and then he died. Now, when Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, as men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. But the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever. He is mortal. His days will be 120 years. Now the Lord God saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. See, Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. 
God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you ought to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters upon the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Everything that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to take two of every living creature with you into the ark. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of creature that moves along the ground, of every kind of animal will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God had commanded him. Now in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth and the floodgates of the heavens were opened and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and his sons' wives, entered the ark. Pairs of all living creatures of every kind came to Noah and into the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. Now for 40 days the floods kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the waters. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the mountains of the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet. Every living thing on the face of the earth perished. Birds, livestock, creatures that move along the ground, and all mankind, everything that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and those with him in the ark. The waters flooded the earth for 150 days. But God remembered Noah and all the wild animals that were with him in the ark, and he sent a wind over the earth, and the waters receded. Now the springs of the deep and the floodgates of the heavens had been closed, and the rain had stopped falling from the sky. The water receded steadily from the earth, and on the 17th day of the seventh month, the tops of the mountains became visible. The waters continued to recede until the 10th month, and on the first day of the 10th month, the ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Now after 40 days, Noah opened the window he had made in the ark, and he, he sent a dove out to see if the water receded from the surface of the ground. But the dove could find no place to set its feet, so it returned to Noah in the ark. He reached out his hand and brought the dove back to himself in the ark. He, he waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. And this time, when it returned to him in the evening, there, in its beak, was a freshly plucked olive leaf. Then Noah knew that the water had receded from the surface of the ground. Now he waited seven more days and again sent out the dove from the ark. But this time, it did not return to him. Then God said to Noah, Come out of the ark, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. So Noah came out of the ark, together with his wife and his sons and their wives. All the animals came out of the ark, one kind after another. Then Noah built an altar there to the Lord and worshipped. The Lord was pleased and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of man even though every inclination of the thoughts of his heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. As long as the earth endures, cold and heat, seed time and harvest, summer and winter, day and night, 
will never cease. Then God said, See, I put my rainbow in the clouds. Whenever the rainbow appears, I will see it, and I will remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. The sons of Noah who came out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now from these came the peoples who were scattered over the face of the earth. Now Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. Well, when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk, and he lay uncovered inside his tent. Now Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness, and he told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders, and they walked in backwards and covered their father's nakedness. Their, their faces were turned the other way so that they would not see their father's nakedness. Now when Noah awoke from his wine, and found out what his youngest son had done to him? He said, Cursed be Canaan, the lowest of slaves will he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. May Canaan be the slave of Shem. May God extend the territory of Japheth, and may Japheth live in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. And then he died. Now this is the account of Noah's sons, who themselves had sons after the flood. From the sons of Japheth came the maritime peoples, who scattered out into their territories to the north and to the west. The sons of Ham were Cush, the father of Nimrod, whose kingdoms were Babylon and Assyria, where he built Nineveh. Mizraim, also known as Egypt, from the Philistines came. And Canaan, the father of the Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites, and Canaanites. The Canaanite clan scattered toward Sidon and toward Sodom. And Gaza. Now, the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Babylon and they settled there. They said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, If there's one people, they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so that they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. See, that is why it was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, he scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This is the account of Shem. Two years after the flood, Shem became the father of a fox. Shem lived 500 years, then he died. A fox became the father of Shelah. A fox lived 403 years, then he died. Shelah became the father of uh, uh, Eber. <laughs> Shelah lived uh, 403 years, then he died. Eber became the father of Peleg. Eber lived 430 years, then he died. Peleg became the father of Ru. Peleg lived 209 years, then he died. Ru became the father of Sarah. Ru, Ru lived 207 years, then he died. Sarah became the father of Nahor. Sarah lived 200 years, then he died. Nahor became the father of Terah. Nahor lived 119 years, then he died. Terah. <coughs> had a son. He called him Abram. Terah took his son, Abram, his grandson, Lot, Abram's nephew, his daughter-in-law, Sarai, Abram's wife, and together they set out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. But when they arrived in Haran, well, they settled there. Terah died in Haran. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Leave your country and your people and your father's household and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will make your name great. I will bless you and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all nations on earth will be blessed through you. 
So Abram left, <laughs> as the Lord had told him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all the people they had acquired, the possessions they had accumulated in Haran, and they set off for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Now, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give your offspring this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord, who had appeared to him. Now, Abram, now, he had become very wealthy in livestock and silver and gold. And Lot, who was traveling about with Abram, also had herds and flocks and tents, so that the land could not support them while they stayed together. And so quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, for we are brothers. Look, is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. Well, Lot looked up, and he saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord. So Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot pitched his tents among the cities of the plain near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly before the Lord. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O oh, sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? You, you have given me no children, so a, a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and he said to him, Look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. God also said to him, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated for 400 years. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and they will come out with great possessions in the fourth generation. You, however, will go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. Now on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram and said to him, to your descendants, I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, Kenizzites, Cadmonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Raphaites, Amorites, Canaanites, Girgashites, and Jebusites. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children. But she had an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my maidservant. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan for 10 years, Sarai gave Hagar to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, <laughs> she began to despise her mistress. So Sarai said to Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my servant in your arms and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Abram said, your servant is in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. So Sarai mistreated Hagar and she fled from her. Now the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert and said to her, Hagar, 
servant of Sarai. Where, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Go back to your mistress and submit to her. You are now with child, and you shall have a son. You shall name him Ishmael. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone, and everyone's hand against his. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. So Hagar bore Abram a son. And Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son Hagar had borne him. Abram was 87 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. Now, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. No longer will you be called Abraham. Your name will be, no longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. I will make you very fruitful. Kings will come from your body. For I have made you the father of many nations. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, for the generations to come. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You ought to undergo circumcision, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. Every male who is eight days old must be circumcised including those born in your household or bought with your money, those who are not your offspring, they must be circumcised. Any uncircumcised male will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. As for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. Abraham fell face down. He laughed to himself. Will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? <laughs> and Abraham said to God, if, if only... Uh, Ishmael might live under your blessing. <laughs> yes, but your wife Sarah will bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will bless him and will surely make him into a great nation, but my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. When he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. On that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money, every male in his household, and he circumcised them. <laughs> Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised, and his son Ishmael was 13. Now the Lord appeared to Abraham again, this time near the great trees of Mamre, as he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and he saw three men standing nearby. He hurried to meet them and then bowed low with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please uh, do not pass your servant by. Uh, let, uh, let a little water be brought. You, you can wash your feet, then you may all rest under this tree. Let, let me get you something to eat, and you can be refreshed, and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they said. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried to the tent to Sarah and said, Quick, bake some bread. 
He then ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf, and he gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. He then brought some curd and milk and the calf that had been prepared, and he set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? they asked him. There, in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you at about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah, she was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. She laughed as she thought to herself, now that I am worn out and my husband is old, will I have this pleasure? <laughs> then the Lord said, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year and Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was afraid, so she lied and she said, I did not laugh. <laughs> but he said, yes, you did. <laughs> laugh. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham followed along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said to Abraham, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The two angels turned away and went toward Sodom. But Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached him and said to him, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Well, what if there are 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? Then the Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold <laughs> as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is, say, five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city because of five people? The Lord answered, if I find 45 there, I will not destroy it. Well, what if only 40 can be found there? For the sake of 40, I will not destroy it. May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? For the sake of 30, I will not destroy it. What if only 20 can be found? <laughs> I will not destroy it if I find 20. May the Lord not be angry. Let me speak just once more. <laughs> what if only 10 can be found there? The Lord answered, for the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. After he'd finished speaking with Abraham, God left and Abraham returned home. Now the two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting at the entrance to the city. When he saw them, he hurried to meet them and bowed low with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, please uh, <coughs> turn aside to your servant's house. <laughs> you can get something to eat, wash your feet, and go on your way early in the morning. <laughs> But the angel said, no, we will spend the night in the square. But Lot insisted so strongly that they did come with him. He prepared a meal for them, and they ate. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside and closed the door behind him and said, My lords, please, do not do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let, let me bring them out to you. You can do whatever you like to them, but do not do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of our way, they replied. 
This fellow came here as an alien, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. <laughs> the men move forward to break down the door, but the angels pulled Lot back inside and shut the door. Then they struck the men with blindness so that they could not find the door. The angel said to Lot, do you have anyone else here or anyone else in the city? Get them out of here because the Lord has instructed us to destroy the place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went outside and he spoke to the two men who were pledged to marry his daughters. When he told them what the angels had said, <laughs> they thought he was joking. At the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, hurry! When he hesitated, the angels grabbed his hand and the hands of his wife and of his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. Run for your lives! Don't look back and don't stop anywhere in the plain. By the time Lot reached Zoar, the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah. Thus he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, including all those living in the city and also the vegetation in the land. But Lot's wife, she looked back. She became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land, like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe. Now the Lord was gracious, and he did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah bore Abraham a son when he was a hundred years old. And Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah had bore him. Now when Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God had commanded him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter. <laughs> and whoever hears about this will laugh with me. <laughs> Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he answered. Then the Lord said, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When they had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, they set out for the place that God had told him about. Now on the third day, he looked up and he saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood he had cut for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac, while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Father? Yes, my son. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? 
Abraham answered. God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. My son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there, and then he arranged the wood on it. And then he bound his son Isaac, and he laid him on top of the wood. And then he reached out his hand to take the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he answered. Then the Lord said, do not lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, for you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering on the altar instead of his son. Therefore Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. <laughs> and to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I have three children, and uh, I can tell you, I cannot imagine having to make that trip. Uh, I can't imagine that. Um, I don't know, but I'm just guessing as a father, maybe he didn't tell Sarah where he was going, what he was up to. <laughs> just my guess, I don't know. That's, that's, I'm reading into the text a little, you know, I just don't think he would have made it out of the house. Oh my goodness. Um, what an amazing thing God has done for us in giving us his son, his only son. Just amazing. And the picture here in Genesis of what he is going to do through Christ. A couple thousand years later, that's exactly what happened on that very place, Mount Moriah. On the mountain of the Lord, Jerusalem, it was provided. Jesus. God's son shed his blood, became the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. He died for every one of us. Even while we were still strangers. Um, I had an experience about a year and a half ago. Uh, my wife and I got to go to Uganda. The last time I was here, I believe, um, uh, for those of you who have seen me before here, every time I present the scriptures, I've uh, committed to sharing the, the neediest people on the planet with the audience. Uh, God really impressed upon me that this is an act of worship and it's not about entertainment. And I want to compel people to, to obedience and to fruitfulness. I don't want to just have people leave and say, hey, that was neat, because this is God's word. And he really convicted me um, and just kind of brought me to a whole new place spiritually about a year and a half ago on our trip to Uganda. We went to Africa to visit one of the kids that we sponsored. Uh, her name is Juliana. She is an AIDS orphan, uh, or she was at the time that we sponsored her. When we got there, uh, her mother had been dead. She had died of AIDS at 36, and uh, she had been dead for maybe about five months when we got there. And what had just happened is her father had married her mother's sister because her mother's sister's husband had also died within a couple of weeks of AIDS. So when we got there and we met her, she was still grieving her mother, and so she just clung to my wife, Teresa, and, and I just kind of went, oh, um, because, you know, I'm hearing 
all of the story. And so we go in her little tent and her little, it's, you know, not even the size of this part of the stage, about this big. Um, and when we came in, my kids had been writing her, and I saw all of her letters on her wall, all of their letters, and I, I started to get convicted. Now, you gotta, you gotta picture me, I'm just the total tourist here. I got the hat on, and the sunglasses, and I'm, I got my little bottle of water. I've been sitting in the van all day, and I get out. And so I thought, ah, I don't have, I got a couple of her letters, where are they? There's one on the refrigerator. I, I just realized I had not taken it as seriously as she had. And um, I started to get humbled. And they said, we want to show you what we did as soon as you sponsored Juliana. So they took us outside. We walked around the back of the house. They showed us this little PVC pipe, with just a little, like a little round plastic pipe. And it had a little tin on it around the edge of the building. And then it just, it dropped down into uh, like a, a container, like a big tank. And they said, we install this. And uh, they started to tap, there's a little tap on it, start to tap the water on it. And all the kids in the village, everybody started to, to come around. And I thought, boy, this is a big event. They're getting a drink. I mean, ooh, you know. So I was kind of looking around, I'm sipping my water, kind of going, okay, did, we, did I say something? Did we do something? What's going on? And our guide told me that the reason why it's such a big deal is because they're able to catch the rainwater off the roof. And the, the biggest problem is their water. So I'm drinking my water still. Not thinking, drinking my bottle of water. Said, hey, you want to see where the, the, the water source is for the, this village where most of these people are getting their water? There, there are a handful of kids sponsored in this village so far. They have this, but this is where most of, this is where she was getting it before. So I walked like from here to the back of the room, maybe 50, not even 50 yards. And it was a little small runoff. It was about, it was about the size of the stage. It wasn't a lake. It was a little pond, almost like a construction runoff. And it had a nice yellowish water in there. And it had a little layer of that green stuff on the top around the edge. And I'm like, and there's just a line of kids going down, uh, waiting in line to be able to dip out of this water. And they would stand on a rock that, that came out into the water. And they'd take this long stick that they had taped together, this little half a plastic cup they had cut in half. And they would stretch that out as far as they could to get into the center of the pond. And they'd dip down in there and, and, and bring water back and pour it into whatever their container was. They put a banana in the top and then they'd either get on a bike and, and ride away with that or put it on their shoulder or on their head and start walking away. And so I'm looking at this and I'm seeing, I'm thinking of my kids at home because I've got what? Uh, Aislinn's five, Zach is uh, 12, and, and Ariel's 10. And at the time they were, yeah, they were like four, nine, and 10. And I'm sitting there thinking, That's, these are my kids, this could be my kids. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, I, and my first godly thought was, oh, I can't imagine having my kids come, have to do this, run this chore. He's telling me these kids come from up to 15 miles away just to get this water. And I'm still sipping on my water, my bottled water, a little slow. So I sit down on the rock there, and it just, conviction hits me. God just tells me, you see these kids? I love them more than you could ever love your kids. And I realized right at that moment that I did not have God's love in my heart in an area. It wasn't like God's love. My love was my friends, my kids, people I know, that's it. And I was, then I started with the excuses. But I, <laughs> I'm already sponsoring as many kids as I can. I'm doing this, I'm doing that. I brought, brought, just ripped off my laundry list of stuff I was doing and God convicted me and said, I don't, you know, th this is about today. What are you doing? What are you gonna do today with me? And uh, that really started a whole dialogue with God and he really convicted me and has been driving me to, to listen to him and to decide every day what he wants me to do with my five loaves and two fish. And he told me to use my voice. And so as I sat there on that rock, I said, you know what, I'm going to use my voice to try to help some more of these kids. I have, that's my five loaves and two fish I have. And that's why I'm sharing this with you right now. Um, God used that to really transform my spiritual walk. Um, he showed me that it's not, it's, it's daily, it's moment by moment. We get opportunities to join God in what he's doing. 
And too often, just like me, we're walking around with the water of life in our hands, sipping on it, while people, strangers right around us, have never even tasted it. I realized I hadn't even thought to share my water with any one of the kids even. I hadn't even thought about it. I was so wrapped up in my own whatever it was. Um, and that has been a real conviction. And it's just kind of opened my heart so that now I, get, I ask God, what do you want me to do? I don't tell him I only have five loaves and two fish. I ask him what he wants me to do. Because sometimes it's somebody I know that can do something. Sometimes he wants me to pray for somebody. Sometimes he wants me to use my resources. Sometimes he wants me to use resources I forgot I had, that I didn't know I had. Um, but I get to participate in what he's doing as opposed to decide, you know what? Here's your level of participation in my life, God. Based on my five loaves and two fish, I don't want you to multiply anything out of that. And God has really done some amazing things in my life. So um, I, I can't recommend that posture enough. Maybe God's been impressing upon you something he wants you to do. Maybe you're not listening to him as people right around you that need the water of life, the gospel, the words of life that you're holding on to. Maybe you're looking at the Bible every morning, taking verses in. They need that, and you don't realize they're right around you, and they're drinking that polluted water. Um, so that, that's just been my passion this year, sharing that. If you want to sponsor a child, they're back on the table. I bring children with me now, and... Um, you can sponsor them for as long or as short as you like, but the way World Vision works, it's very much like the Samaritan. Um, they, their whole, whole purpose is to create people that are self-sufficient and become saviors of their villages. They train them to be able to be self-sufficient. It takes three to five years, typically, for them to turn a village around and make it completely self-sufficient. Now, at the end of that time, they'll send you a letter saying, do you want to sponsor another child? This child is in a self-sufficient village they're taken care of. And you, of course, can continue to write to the child, but you'll have the opportunity to sponsor somebody else who's more needy. And I love that model. They're very good stewards, but pick up one of the picture folders, open it up, and fill out uh, the form inside, tear that off, and hand it to the person who's at the table. Take the picture home. It'll take about two weeks. You'll be able to start corresponding with your child uh, back and forth. And let me tell you, just a letter from us, the hope that it gives people. Giving people hope is such a priceless thing. Just a letter from us. We have no idea of the impact that has on somebody um, who is in a daily situation. They, did, they don't really know what's going to happen every day they wake up. Um, good stuff. So I encourage you to do that. Normally, uh, the last time I was here, I brought CDs and DVDs. I don't do that any longer. Uh, they're all available online. I have a subscription you can get to if you want to just get all of my resources. Uh, there is a form there. You can pick that up, fill that out, and leave it with us um, uh, because we've uploaded everything to our website to make it easier for everybody to get and to cut cost on every, everything for everybody. Um, I want to thank you, and I, I want to ask you to pray for us. We have gotten death threats on Facebook and on Twitter. Uh, the FBI's had to track down people because um, I've watched the trend of, um, well, Christians being persecuted in this country rise. And just because you're speaking God's word, you think that's as simple and uncontroversial, it's become more and more an issue. People are writing news articles saying, this guy's going to come and quote the Bible. The, the whole thing, I mean, exaggerating it and calling a church extreme if I go there or not because they're going to listen to the Bible. You know, like it's a dangerous thing. Um, but pray for us that we become even more bold, that God gives us more opportunities to share his word, and that the church in general will not be ashamed of Christ and his words in our generation. Because that's what we're seeing, just the watering down of truth and a backing away of, I don't really want to be identified with somebody who really believes these words. I, I, might, I might believe some of it, I might not. That's how a lot of churches are pushing themselves into that category. So pray to that end, because we really, boy, I'll tell you what, I get to a lot of different denominations, a lot of churches, and in the last five years in particular, I've just seen a real, um, a real, um, uh, I guess, churches becoming much more uh, concerned with not being associated with the Word of God 
with believing the word of God. Let's say that. Um, so pray for us to that end. Thank you so much for coming out and for having ears to hear and for welcoming God's word and welcoming me. Thank you. Thank you. He asked us to pray for him, and so let's pray for him and his ministry. Uh, Lord, we lift your servant Mark he up to you and ask that in his travels and in his work, as he proclaims God's word, uh, bless him, watch over him, protect him, and keep him. And may hearts be open and minds be open to the truth of God's word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. And I can speak Thank very well. I, I will never read the book of Genesis in the same way again. <laughs> Thank you. All right. That's nice. That's uh, nice. Before we go, we're going to take up an offering, but I want you to just remain standing, okay? This is called a hymnal, okay? I don't know if you've ever seen one or not. They're under the pews or in the back of the pews, and we're going to sing a hymn. Uh, we have candy back there. I see some choir folks I know who would love to get their hymnal. And come up here and help me, wouldn't you, Dave? And uh, Melissa, come on up here. If you got a hymnal, and you're going to turn to hymn number 144, and this offering we're taking up is uh, going to help Marquis and his ministry. See y'all? Come on, choir folk. They're going to come up here and help me sing. Number 144. This is the way our forebears used to do it. They had these things called hymnals. You guys gonna let me sing in the choir now? Okay. Yeah. God has so richly blessed us tonight and to be able to sing his hymns, to listen to his word about creation and about the gift that he provided to us in Jesus Christ. Let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Lord, as we leave this place tonight, richer, fuller, and more alive because of your word. We thank you. Bless each family uh, represented here tonight. Bless your church. 
And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless everybody. Have a great week. Amen. Thanks for coming up here and helping me. I, after preaching all day, I couldn't hit those high notes.